Okay, uh, hi everyone, it's SpiffyQ, SpiffyQ.com, and uh, today we actually have a game analysis. I haven't done one of these in a while. This is going to be a follow-up to uh, the last video I made on the Queen's Gambit Accepted. We're going to take a look at an opening which got me really interested, sorry, got me, a, a game that got me really interested in the Queen's Gambit Accepted. It's played by a friend of mine, there, uh, it was an online game, uh, both people are rated over 2,000, and it's kind of a strange game in the sense that not a lot seems to be happening in the early uh, middle game slash end game. And then it's as if Black just flips a switch. Let's make that better. Aha. And completely takes over and is dominating, and White is just swept off the board. Like, Whoa, wh where did that come from? Got me really interested in the opening. Not up to actually play it very much, but uh, I eventually did play it, and as I talked about, it's actually one of my better performing openings um, when, when I do do it. So I'm going to skip over the, um, the opening a little bit, again, because I just covered it in a 20-minute video, and we're going to look at kind of the positional editor. Because it's games like this, where this not much happens, and all of a sudden there's a positional explosion, if you will. It's not wild tactics, though it kind of is, but it's just a dominant position which has really shaped my view and um, how I play chess, my, my take on chess, and how I think and explain about it. It's games like this had a really big impact on my development, even though I was only uh, an observer. Anyway, so the opening, it was the, uh, the E4 version of the Queen's Gambit Accepted, and so far it's just like the video I mentioned, even to right here with Bishop E6. And so um, in the video, um, sorry, my previous video, I talked quite a bit about the exchanging on e6. Here, um, keep playing the main line, bishop to b5, and then bishop c5. Let me just back up for a second. So when we look at a position like this, right here, um, kind of the philosophy of the queen's gambit accepted, as it was explained to me, is that on, on move two, you take the pawn, you're accepting the gambit, but you're not trying to hang on to the gambit. That's not the whole goal. It's not you're going to win Win material, then it's your precious that you'll never let go, and you're gonna, you know, fall it, <laughs> fall it into a volcano. No, it's you're accepting the pawn. And you're gonna make it hard for White to win it back, but you're gonna let him win it back. It's not the be all and end all. For instance, here in this position, it's possible, in the sense that it's a legal move, to play c5, trying to hang on to the pawn. But is that really a move you want to play when we've got this, you know, all this pressure in the world? where white is one move away from castling, the center is wide open, we're multiple moves away from castling, f7 is a sitting duck, we're really trying to win a pawn? Is that it? No, 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 no. We're, we don't want to make these incredibly weakening moves to hang on to material. And again, chess is about checkmate, not about hanging on to pawns. And so if we're making these wild, crazy moves, moves we would never make otherwise, except trying to hang on to a pawn, it's probably a move we don't want to make. C5 is one such move here. Compare that here, where we play bishop C5. Now again, we're reinforcing the pawn, but we're doing it with a developing move. We're getting ready to castle, and even if white does win the pawn back, that's fine, the bishop is on a good square. So a, a very different um, a, a philosophy behind it. Yes, we've accepted the pawn, we're temporarily at material, but we're... It's not predestined that we need to hang on to that material. We're allowed to give it back. It's perfectly okay. You're allowed to do that. That's, that's important. You'll, you'll, you'll see why. Uh, Knight B to D2 was played in the game. Actually, I just checked the theory. Um, I, I had no idea what the theory, or this was theory, but it turns out it is. And the main move is B4, actually, in the databases, which is interesting. Offering a pawn. Now, given the spiel I just said, you can probably tell we shouldn't be taking pawns. Right? Uh, the goal isn't to win more material, and that's exactly the case. Taking this pawn is pretty much poison. Because after queen a4, um, the bishop, again, this knight is pinned, so the bishop is completely unprotected. You know, you could try and play a5, or he's going to kick it back, that's fine. a3, and now knight takes d4. So white has won the pawn on d4, and now look at this. He's got all this pressure right here on c6. The knight's attacking c6, knight's also attacking this. Uh, uh oh, um, this bishop has two beautiful diagonals. Center is wide open. Black is still multiple moves away from castling. Things are not good. Um, not things have gone terribly wrong, and we know exactly why, because Black got greedy and took another pawn. No, 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 no. So when White offers this pawn with B4, we don't take it. No, no, no. Uh, we slide back. 
And then theory suggests the following. A5, A6, take, take, A5, bishop, let's look at one more move. Uh, bishop to B2. So white has given up the two bishops, but in exchange, he has shattered black's pawn structure. Uh, this pawn is almost certainly going to uh, he's going to fall. One of these pawns is going to fall. He's got a lot of space on the queen side, and no real weaknesses. Whereas black, of course, he does have a couple of weaknesses here. And this is the type of position where really white is playing for true results. White's either going to win this or it's going to be a draw. He has no weaknesses, and it's fine. I'm, I've never played this position. I'm not sure. Again, this is the type of Queen's Gambit accepted line that I would play. So I'm going to have to look at this a little bit more uh, deeper to see if this is a line I want to play or I might need to revise my Queen's Gambit accepted repertoire. <laughs> Darn theory. Anyway, this wasn't played in the game. It was uh, knight b to d2 with the idea of likely bringing the knight here, hitting c5, and just developing the knight. Ended up playing knight to e7, and then knight g5. Attacking the bishop. And here is the one... Um, if black makes a mistake, it's going to be this next move. Is black ended up playing knight to g6. Now, to understand this move, um, it's helpful to notice that we can't castle right away. Castling simply loses instantly to queen to h5. It's threatening checkmate on h7. Only way to stop it is h6. But then it's simply take, take, bishops hanging, and black can resign. Whoops, that's not very good. So um, we can't castle. And so black, uh, my friend, was trying to provoke this exchange. And so it ended up playing knight to g6. With the idea of now the queen is attacking the knight, hoping to provoke the exchange, and then maybe the knight can find a home on one of these two squares. Though this doesn't really make too much sense when you think about it, because white wants to play f4 at some point. I'll just put that on the board like this. And f4 both stops the knight from jumping to f4, and it also controls e5. And so the knight isn't really doing anything. So knight to g6 was a wasted move. Um, a move such as queen to d6, maybe pairing h6, maybe we castle the queen side, um, is more fitting with the position. Anyway, uh, knight to g6... White, of course, took on e6, retook, and then queen to c2. Notice if the knight were still here on e7, then it would be defending the c6 knight. Uh, it's not. It's over here. It's not really doing anything. It's almost out of play. And now there's not only hitting the, uh, the c5 bishop, but also the c6 knight. So things look, uh-oh. But it's not too bad, because remember, black is up a pawn. He, uh, in this case she, is happy to give back a pawn. Uh, it, it's absolutely fine. And so rather than, you know, um, trying to curl into a ball with queen to d6 and maybe knight c5 is coming or something else, simply played, whoops, let's try that again, simply played bishop to b6. White took, took, check, and then we move the king. So uh, I, maybe I said the beginning of the game is a little bit boring. It does get boring. Uh, here it doesn't look very boring, does it? But at the same time, what's interesting is that in order to cash in on c6, white had to give up the light squared bishop, right? In order for white to win the pawn back, it was necessary to exchange that bishop. And by doing so, that means the light squares aren't as weak as they could be. Like in this position, if there were a bishop on b5 or on c4, right, staring at right here, oh yeah, um, black is in huge trouble. But here, we're kind of okay. Kind of a lot of okay, actually. It's also nice that this knight on, on d2, it's blocking this bishop, and it's also blocking the d-file. So the knight is not on a very good square. That explains why, um, in the game, white ended up playing knight f3. Uh, hitting d4, letting rook d1 come out, maybe bishop g5, and everything makes sense. At the same time, this gives black a chance to play queen to d6, and then white kind of chickens out and ex exchanges queens. You would think with a, a king on f7, you want to keep the queens on. But at the same time, the computer isn't completely sure. The computer doesn't like exchanging queens. But the computer also says something like uh, queen b5 or something else is only about, you know, the nominal white advantage, just like any other position. And so uh, there evidently isn't a lot of ways to attack the king. Well, that's what the computer says at least. And um, we're going to explore the endgame a bit deeper. 
Um, more interesting, perhaps more critical, would be something along the lines of playing f4 first. Maybe playing f5, trying to get the king um, open that way. At the same time, perhaps um, white simply has, black simply has time to escape, and the same um, queen tr trade attempt might also work. As it is in the game, again, it was knight f3, and then take, take. And so we've reached this position. More critically, let's look at the next move. Rook d1, e5. And so here's where um, the position is completely calmed down. All right, it's got boring. Let's take stock. And so uh, material, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. Material is completely equal. So um, that's fine. Both sides have bishops. Both sides have knights. Both sides have rooks. So there's no material imbalance. Black has double pawns, which is less good, but he also has a protected pass pawn. Whoops. I'll edit that out. Uh, protected pass pawn, which is fantastic. On the downside, these pawns are all on dark squares, and this is a dark square bishop, and so this bishop is not as active as it could be. On the plus side, this knight is actually looking quite nice here, because there's always this threat of jumping in here to, um, to f4, where the knight would be very, very nice. In terms of open files, this rook it just moved to the d file, but now it's completely blocked, and so the rook isn't doing very much. Uh, C file is open, but both sides can fight for that. F file is half open, and so we can get some chances potentially to pressure there. And the B file is half open, so there's a chance to pressure here. When you look at all of that, it seems as if there's a bit more... Um, black has more options, right? We can put something on the F file, maybe invade over here, maybe put something on the C or the B file, that looks great. Whereas white has put something on the C file. Not a heck of a lot. Maybe this knight could jump into here onto uh, f5. Maybe. But that never actually that never occurred in the game. What I'm trying to suggest in this position is that it's actually easier for black to come up with a plan. And we'll actually notice how white never actually comes up with a plan. White never does anything constructive throughout the rest of the game. White starts drifting. And black, just through a series of little tiny moves, is able to suddenly, again, with the snap of the fingers, get into a really good position. So let's really explore this. So white started with b3. Sure, why not? So this is stopping any potential um, threats on the b file you know, before they even start. And the bishop might want to come to a3 where it's targeting a weak pawn. Sure, why not? Black plays king e6. Most natural move on the board. Right? We're getting, uh, brings the king close to the center, getting ready to pick that pawn. White then plays bishop to d2. And this was already this first inkling that maybe white doesn't know what white's doing. Even though, again, white raided over 2,000. Because you play b3 and then you don't bring the bishop over here. What's the bishop doing here? Is the bishop going to b4? Like... Uh, the only thing this bishop does is kind of lets this rook slide over, but it gets in a way like, is this really the best square for the bishop? What's the follow-up? There isn't really anything. White ended up playing h6 just to stop any potential knight g5s. All right, nice. White then played b4. So do we see this? Do we see this confusion in white where he plays b3, and then bishop d2, and then b4, and we have no idea why. What's the next move? What's going on? Are you really thinking about playing a4, a5? Is, is that your master plan? You're spending three... Like, why did you not play b4 immediately? What's... What is it? White doesn't know what to do. Let's compare this suddenly with black. d5. Opening things up. Just look what would happen. It did, this didn't happen. Take, take. We can see this huge difference with the kings. Uh, Black's king is very active, um, helping um, shepherd the pawn. Because this bishop has unfortunately put itself in front of d2, there's no immediate pins. Also, by playing h6, we can see how it's really limited what this bishop could do. Uh, this bishop has no future anywhere on any of the diagonals, in fact. The bishop has really become quite poor. We talked earlier about this bishop for Black. It seemed like it was a poor bishop because of the pawns. But these pawns can move. They could start moving forward. And then the bishop would come alive. We're going to see this later on. 
Also, by um, and more mundanely, by playing d5, black is getting rid of a double pawn. Woohoo, that's nice. Ended up playing uh, rook to e1. We then, we, black then took the open c file before white had a chance. And then h4. Kind of a critical moment. What do you do as black? Because the threat here is going to be h5, evidently, and hitting the knight back. And so, after h5, the knight would have to go somewhere, doesn't really want to go here, onto f4, because then white would exchange his really not doing anything bishop for the knight, and then that just helps ease his, uh, white's, uh, uh, white's task. Also notice the potential problem. Uh, I talked about all the great things that d5 does, and sure, d5 is great. But if we play h5 and the knight moves somewhere, in fact, let me just play a nothing move. You know, h5, let's move the knight here. After take, we have two things attacking the pawn, the pawn's in trouble. And so black needs to be extremely accurate here. I ended up playing rook h to f8, and then h5. And so you're probably guessing, okay, so the rook is here. And so that's going to help us bring the knight to f5. Um, and then we're going to recapture the rook, and we're going to try and pressure on the f-file. That makes a certain amount of sense. That's not what happened. So what did happen? If you were to ask yourself, now, hopefully I didn't give it away. It's probably not knight e7, because again, after knight to e7, then it's that exact same variation. That's not very good. So it's not, e not knight f4. What else could it be? It was a fantastic exchange sacrifice. Let's take a look. Rook takes f3. Takes. Now we move the knight. Now the knight doesn't have to come to f4. It can come to a better square. To h4. <laughs> Isn't this great? So let's take stock. What's happened? Well, by sacrificing the rook for the knight, we've done a couple of things. First, okay, yes, so we're, we're down some uh, material, but we've completely ruined white's pawn structure. Now there's some weakness over here. Look how this knight is perched here. By the, when there was a knight there, it controlled that square. Now there's no knight. Our knight there. Our knight is threatening a massive fork on f3. In fact, it's, you can't even defend it, can you? You can't go to g2. Our knight defends that. That's not very good. You can't play the rook here. That doesn't work. You can't just play f4 to move it because that's still check. And it's hitting everything. Literally everything in the white camp. And so, not we haven't just given up the exchange. We're going to win at least one pawn. Excellent. That's fantastic. But what else has happened? Is we've given up. Um, white has lost his knight. The knight was useful. It was pressuring um, the, the e5 square. The only minor piece it has left is the bishop. The bishop is stairs of the pawn. And it's got no good squares anywhere. In fact, this bishop is just in the way. It'd be better if that bishop could miraculously disappear in exchange for uh, uh, for Black's bishop. The bishop is terrible. Our rook controls the open, only open file, and it could also slide over and pressure this file. Not that file. This file. Excellent. So Black has an incredible amount of play. We're gonna win, he's going to win a pawn back, and it's just uh, it's fantastic. White ended up uh, taking the pawn with check. Sure, okay. And then plays rook e to d1. And what's fantastic is that uh, it would love, again, to do something like this, uh, challenge the c-file, but again, uh, knight takes f3 is coming with check, which is also pick up the, the bishop and things are, uh, are, uh, are bad. Sorry. And so uh, ended up coming in. So we can see how all of black pieces are alive. And there's a, a, a concrete threat of being able to play e3, pawns floats for motion, Bishop comes in, rook, and we got some problems. White is, uh oh, hanging on. Comes back to f3. We finally take it with check. King goes to f1. Uh, sure, why not? King goes to c4. And now just look at look at the domination of the black pieces. If we and if we just let's compare this position to um, let's look at this position. I think, yes. Uh, let's maybe make sure I get that right. So, this is so hard. Here to here. There we go. Here, here. Do we see what's happened? Do we see what the exchange sacrifice has done? We've gone this position, which is even-ish, equal. Okay, who knows what's happening? 
to here. Where if you don't count the material, even if you do count the material, if you're just looking at it, Black has made substantial progress. Which, of course, he has. White ended up trying to... Um, Let's just watch how White turns the screws to win, because it's only, as you can tell, black, White isn't able to hang on much longer. Plays d3. Take, take, and now that pawn is uh, one square away from promotion. King comes to d3. And again, like, just look at this. What can White do? The bishop can't move. The rook can't move. Uh, unbelievable. So then we had to ask, okay, but what can Black do? After b5, uh, black found the easiest way to um, win this position. Ended up taking the bishop. King goes to d2, threatening uh, to queen. Then after check, king c3, here's where white resigned. Because there's simply no defense to king to b2, and then c1 queen. That's game. And so you can see what I mean, how this is kind of a nothing game. Because as soon as the queens got exchanged, not much really happened. There's not a lot white can do. There's not a lot black can do. Right? Like these moves, nothing's really happening. And then it's this bolt from the blue that kind of came out of nowhere. Take, and then this. And so, uh, so I always want to look back when I look at these amazing moves, which completely changed the course. And I try and ask myself, all right, how do I justify that move? Or how can I understand this move so that way I can play it in my own games? Like, what's the telltale sign? And I think, honestly, the main thing is how crappy this bishop is. And how this knight was attacking here. And just a little bit of calculation showed that after take, take, here... There's actually no defense to knight takes f3 winning back a pawn. And so immediately, like whenever you give up material, it's always a little bit, it's always scary, right? Whenever you sacrifice. If you're able to, you know, win a pawn or something back, then it's a bit less scary, right? If you give up um, an exchange, but you win two pawns, you're not even down material. So that's great. And so if you can just look at this position and you realize, okay, you're gonna win back a pawn. And then it's that secondary idea. What can white do? The bishop can't move, he's, and he's, uh, um, he has to do something to protect that bishop, right? So, and then we're invading here, and we're invading here, and we've got this d pawn uh, marching up. Uh, brilliant. This pawn is actually uh, very weak as well. If this bishop ever gets exchanged or moved, right, able to win it back. It seems as if there's so much potential here. And perhaps more to the point, what did black have to lose? Like, he's not, there's no threats from white. If you don't play this, you know, it's just going to be one of those long, boring games, right? This is a chance to completely change things up, to play for the win, to use all of the advantages. And that's exactly what happened, right? F3. Also kind of cold-blooded to bring the rook in first, to not take on F3 right away. I, I, that's not something that I would have been able to do. <laughs> I would have uh, uh, jumped in. But notice how by bringing the rook in first, that... Uh, tempts white to make a move such as this and then we come in like this and, and like the rook it's dominating the bishop um, actually not doing much right now but it can after d3 the king is able to further jump in um, we can even just imagine at some point be able to push these pawns what can white do nothing and black's got all these options and then was able to convert uh, again quite easily from here Makes it look effortless. And uh, that's that. And so that's the game that showed me uh, how interesting the Queen's Gambit could be. Which is kind of funny, because if you actually look at this whole game, there's not a lot of, like... This is more of an exchange sacrifice that led to a really dominant endgame win. right? So this is more of an exchange sacrifice than it is a Queen's Gambit you know, accepted sacrifice. It had nothing to do with the opening. But in my head, I've always associated it with this opening, so figure that out. Uh, but this is um, my, 
if I could if I could play every game like this, win, lose, or draw, I would do that. In where it's sacrificing that material, but being able to um, get that dominant position. What's going to happen next? Do you have enough to convert? I find that amazing. Hopefully, I um, uh, shared or I uh, helped you understand that as well. If not, let me know. If there's any questions or comments, uh, feel free. I love talking about this. This is one again. This is one of those really important games that helped shape my uh, development. I think it really sh also by just how the opening isn't that really important. I didn't know anything of the theory about this opening. Didn't know anything about it. Uh, it's and I. If I'm being honest, it isn't about the opening. It was about that rook takes f3. Change the nature of the position. That's what makes chess great. Who cares about the openings? Right? It's things like that. Okay, so before I ramble on anymore, that's that. It's SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com. In the coming days, I'm going to keep adding to the opening survey section. Maybe I'll have more, probably won't have more uh, game analysis right away, but we'll see. Now let me know what you guys want to see, and then I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, that's that. SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye for now.